time is filled with swift transition. Not a bird unmoved can stand and build your hopes on things eternal and hope to God's unchanging. Not a earth unmoved can stand and build your hopes on things eternal and hold to God's unchanging hand. You are to hold to His hands. And God's unchanging hand. You are to just. And trust in him who will not leave you. Come on, church. And whatsoever years may bring. And if by earthly friends forsaken. And still more closely to
thank you for my life being in your hands. Yes, sir. 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 Yes, he can handle it. That's a fact. So I just thank you for your hands. The hands have played a key role in our redemptive story as nails went through your hands. And we just thank you that you hung on Calvary for us. And now our lives are in your hands. And nobody can pluck us out. I just thank you for your hands. Pray now you forgive me of my sin. Cleanse me from unrighteousness. Stand in and speak for me. Let the words of my mouth, meditation of my heart, be acceptable in thy sight. Lord, my strength and my redeemer. In Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Something about those hands. All states say that just depends. Uh, they say that you're in good hands with all state. Somebody said it just depends on whose hands. Basketball in my hands ain't worth but nine dollars and ninety-five cents. <laughs> Put the basketball in the hands of LeBron James is worth thirty-five million dollars. Football in my hand ain't worth but eleven dollars and fifty cents. <laughs> Football in Patrick Mahomes' hand is worth a quarter of a billion dollars. It just depends on whose hand is Nail in my hand is not worth anything but a tetanus shot and a prescription. But a nail in the hand of Jesus.
Hebrews 10, 19 through 25. <clears throat> Read as follows. Having therefore, brethren, boldness to enter into the holiest by the blood of Jesus, mm -hmm. by a new and living way which he hath consecrated for us through the veil that is to save his flesh, mm -hmm. and having a high priest over the house of God. Let us draw near with a true heart and full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast the profession of our faith without wavering, for he that is faithful, for he is faithful. Let us consider one another to provoke unto love and to good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together, as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another so much the more as you see the day approaching. Right. Now, simply want to talk about it's time for us to get back to church. It's time for us to get back to church. It's no secret that the last year and a half has caused us to make some decisions that largely had to do with our health and well-being mm -hmm. as it relates to this coronavirus pandemic. More than 750,000 people alone in the U.S. have died, mm -hmm. and over 5 million worldwide have died mm -hmm. as a result of this deadly, unmerciful disease. Yes. Mm -hmm. There are a quarter of a billion people who have been exposed and are dealing with varying uh, symptoms of this disease. Businesses, banks, schools, eating establishments, and yes, even churches, all closed in the name of not spreading this virus. Many employees began working from home in an attempt to stay safe from being infected. Churches began seeking ways to worship by way of social media with the idea of keeping their members engaged in order to have some semblance of spiritual direction and inspiration. From Facebook Live to YouTube to telephone conference lines, Zoom to Microsoft Meeting, and the list goes on. But somewhere along the way, We've gotten a little too comfortable at home. We say it's too dangerous to go to church. While at the same time, we're at restaurants, Walmart, Meyer, Needlers, Speedway, Shell, the mall, clubs, clubs, and ball games where crowds gather. Many in those crowds are what's called anti-mask and anti-vaccination folk. Yeah, yeah. All right. they, don't, they don't believe in wearing masks. And even though they don't, haven't been vaccinated, uh, it's their right, so they say. So instead of getting the shots or masking, they, they put others at risk. Yeah. And some of us are around them every day. But we say we can't come to church because it's too dangerous. Yes, yes. Uh, somebody at church might give me the virus. I, I can't take any chances. But at the same time, they don't mind being around others who may expose them. And let me say very quickly that there are a few who really need to be careful. And we understand and respect your situations. Uh, but having said that, uh, in my humble opinion, I think it's time that we get back to church. Amen. It's nothing like being in the household of faith Amen. with other like-minded believers well, well, well. as we're built to fellowship one Good. with the other. Yeah. Some of us are more afraid of the coronavirus mm -hmm. than we are the sin virus. <laughs> <laughs> we have no problem keeping company and hanging out with the sin virus. But we're not staying home from gatherings that involve sinful activity. But you do know that there is an already eternal remedy for the sin virus yeah. that many people have refused to receive. 
It's called the blood of Jesus. All right. And it's a one-time treatment. No second shots or boosters are needed. It's not necessary to have to come back in a year to maintain its effectiveness in your system. But the divine blood donor, Jesus Christ himself, will personally administer his blood drawn from his veins that will wash away your sin. And unlike the Moderna and Pfizer, the side effects are love, joy, peace, and contentment. And in our lesson today, the early Jews, Christian Jews, knew something about the blood of Jesus. The book of Hebrews was written to Jewish converts. The first meetings that took place were in synagogues, and the first controversies concerned adherence to uh, Jewish law. Their first critics derided them as Jewish extremists, but for the first Jewish believers, believing in Jesus Christ raised many questions. Amen. What about the temple and the animal sacrifices? What about the law of Moses? Did believing in Christ uh, negate so much that they had grown up believing that it was really enough to put your trust and faith in Jesus Christ? Right. Answers were needed right away yeah, yeah. for those who lived during the time of the writing of the book of Hebrews. Because okay. mm -hmm. tolerance would soon give way to torture and execution. Yeah. Believing in Jesus Christ would become a life or death proposition. Mm -hmm. And the temptation for the Jewish believers to go back to their old ways would be irresistible unless they could know for sure that they had made the right choice. Mm -hmm. And brothers and sisters, when life turns on you, okay. when situations become dire, mm -hmm. and when challenges come in your life, you, you need to know that you made the right choice. Mm -hmm. uh, you heard the song, some folk would rather mm -hmm. have houses and land. Yes. Some folk choose silver and gold. Right. But these things they treasure and forget about their soul. I decide to make Jesus my choice. So I'm going on to say, you know the road is rough. Yeah. Yeah. The going gets tough. Yeah. And the hills are hard to climb. Yeah. I started out such a long time ago. Yeah. And there is no doubt in my mind. Yeah. I decide. Yeah. Now, now you can do what you want to do. You, yeah. you, if you want to stay home on Sunday, that's you. But, but I've decided yeah. to make Jesus my choice. Now, no one knows for sure who wrote the book of Hebrews. The Coptic Church believed that Paul was the writer. Uh, and although they believed that Paul was the author, the language of the book of Hebrews is too polished. And Paul spoke a Greek that was common language among the people. So this polished language in Hebrews points to the fact that Paul was perhaps not the writer of the book. Tertullian believed that Barnabas was the writer of the book of Hebrews because Barnabas is from Cyprus, the region in Greece where a polished, cultural, and educated Greek was spoken. Mm -hmm. And some of the church reformers, Martin Luther and many in his era, thought that the, because of the polished language that it was Apollos. Because Apollos, as my pastor said, Apollos was saved. Uh, he was an intellectual who had good grasp of the Greek language. But Priscilla and Aquila say, with all that polish, you need the Holy Ghost. Yes, so although the identity of the writer of the book of Hebrews is difficult to trace, and we just don't know. Yes, sir. But the message is quite easy to follow. Yeah. Many Jewish believers wanted to reverse their course in order to avoid persecution because they trusted in Jesus Christ. All right, all right. But the writer stops them in their tracks, exhorting them in chapter 6 to go on to perfection. His appeal is based on the superiority and sufficiency of Christ. The Jewish sacrificial system and priestly rule pales in comparison to the finished work of Christ on the cross. The writer insists that Jesus is better than everything that's come before him. As a matter of fact, the theme, one of the themes of the book of Hebrews is better. Jesus is better than the angels because the angels worship him. Jesus is better than Moses because he created Moses. Mm -hmm. Jesus is better than all of the Aaronic priesthood because they sacrificed 
24 hours a day, yeah. 365 days a year. But yeah. Jesus, the sacrifice was once, once. and for all. Yeah. And Jesus is better than the law because through him, he mediates a better covenant. Yes, yes. Therefore, in verse 19, recalls the therefore of Hebrews 4.16. Hebrews 4.16 says, Let us therefore come boldly yes. to the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace yeah. to help in the time of need. Yeah. The passage contains some very important challenges that we need to hear this morning at Mount Olive. Right. These challenges are identified by three let us imperatives. Mm -hmm. Each of the let us statements tell us something we should or should not be doing. These commands tell us that the faithful need the fellowship of the body of Christ. Yes. And as a result, we should get up on Sunday morning Amen. and make our way to church. Live streaming still has its place for those unable to physically attend church. There are some churches like ours who have live streaming of their worship services over the internet. Now, if you're sick or homebound, yeah. and you want to have some, again, semblance of participation at your church, I understand that. Yeah. But what is not healthy is someone who just wants to lay at home in the bed, well. eating biscuits and gravy, watching church on this That's what some people call bedside baptism. <laughs> And in this case, it's not pandemic related. A lot of folk wouldn't come to the church no way. <laughs> but as Christians, I'm appealing to your Christianity now. So don't, don't, don't. He, he getting on my nerve. No, if you say, I ought to be able to appeal to your Christianity. And as Christians, we're designed to be together. We're built to be in the company of and to interdepend on one another. And every chance we get, we ought to make our way to the house of prayer. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. If you can get up and go to work on Monday morning, it's God who gave you the strength to make the well. There's nothing ought to get in the way of you coming to church. Well, we got to get more serious about this matter called church. Because when life gets sour, you're going to need the church. When your life becomes soiled because you have run into sin, you're going to need the church. But when life brings on sorrow, you're going to need the church. When life knocks on your door and drops off some sickness, uh, you're going to need the church. Oh, when I look back at the old folk crowd here in our city, when I look back at my family in the South, Trips we used to make in the summertime. Yeah. They didn't have any money. Many of them dropped out of school in the sixth, seventh, and eighth grade right. because right. they had to work to the land in order to survive. Right. Many of them had newspaper on their walls for wallpaper. Right. And all week long, they were nobody. They were cooks and chauffeurs. Right, they were janitors and domestics, yes, yes. farmers and gardeners. Yeah. And they took care and raised other folks' children. Yeah. We watched that happen with our own mother. She raised the Reller kids, yeah. the Hamilton kids at Mendenhall. Yeah. She raised them. Right. And when they had a problem, they were calling our mother. Yeah. They were in calling the parents. They are calling our mother. Oh, and, and she didn't even get her GED until she was in her 60s. Yeah. But she had wisdom yeah. and the Lord on her side. Yeah. So, so this crowd, this crowd, they, they had to say Miss and Mr. And they were called by and out of their name. Every drinking fountain, every back door, every restaurant counter, every piece of legislation, every courtroom said to them, you don't matter. They, they tell them they were nothing and nobody. And as far as they were concerned, they were nothing and nobody Monday through Saturday. But on Sunday morning, some got a hold of it. Sunday morning, something happened in their life. I remember old song used to say, something got a hold of me. I went to a meeting one night and my heart got right. Something got a hold of me. Something within that hold of the ring. You all remember that. So something happened at God's house that, that just can't happen at your house. This is not an auditorium. This is a sanctuary. The house of the living God. 
And I'm not making a speech. I'm declaring the oracles of God. And in this sanctuary, we have the blessed privilege of being in the presence of God. So whenever that privilege presents itself, you ought to get up, stand up, dress up, show up, and look up. And give God praise and come to his house. There's an old song I learned from the late Dr. E.E. E. Stafford of the Mount Tabor Baptist Church of Los Angeles, and it simply says, I'm glad to be in the service one more time. I, I don't deserve to be here. He didn't have to let me live, but I'm glad to be in the service one more time. I've seen enough that God could have wiped me off the face of the earth. I made enough mistakes in my life that God could have destroyed me a long time ago. But I'm glad to be in the service. I'm glad he let me live to come to the sanctuary because the psalmist reminds us that, that there were some days where my steps were almost gone. My feet had well nigh slipped. When I considered the wicked and uh, how the wicked prospered and the righteous suffered. And then, but I went to the sanctuary. In other words, I went to church. Yes, yes. And there's just something about church yes. that helped keep your mind right. Yes. And there's something about being among God's people and hearing the gospel and the music and the prayer that, that lets you know that I'm so glad yes. the trouble don't last all way. There's a brighter day ahead. Yes. Weeping endures for a night. But just stay there, hang in there, because joy come in the morning. Be not weary in well-doing. In due season you'll reap if you faint not. It may not look like you're going to make it. Uh, look like what we're doing don't even make sense. But just keep on trusting God. And you see that God will make a way out of nowhere. Verses 19 through 22, there is a let us imperative. Let us draw near. First of all, fellowship helps us to draw near. Sometimes we get bogged down on the church not being full of people. All across America, the numbers in many churches are only declining. I have a good friend of mine who was looking at our church through YouTube and the, how the camera shows, it just shows the front, doesn't show people in the back. And, uh, and, and, and he's like, man, you got all the people. I said, no, we don't. We just have who's coming. But, but he's seating, or was seating, a thousand people. And now it's down about 30 or 40. And so, so there's a decline. But let's not worry about a church full of people. Let's concern ourselves with the people being full of church. Yeah. And today we can come boldly because there was a time when we couldn't. Yeah. In the Old Testament, they uh, would approach God at a distance. Then everybody couldn't approach him. As a matter of fact, only the high priest, yeah. and then he could only come once a year on the Day of Atonement. Yeah. They put a rope around his waist and bells on his tassels, and if he fell dead, they used that to drag him out, mm -hmm. because access was only gained and given to the high priest. Mm -hmm. There was a veil, a curtain, that separated the holy place from the most holy place, yeah. and everybody didn't have access. But one Friday at Calvary, yes. Jesus died. Yeah. And when he died, the Bible says the veil that separated the holy place from the most holy place was rent or torn from the top to bottom, knocking out forever an intermediary between man and God. Yeah. Now everybody can come boldly to the throne of grace to find mercy and grace in the time of need. Mm -hmm. Draw near. That's what fellowship means, we can draw near. Mm -hmm. We have to stay outside. We don't have to be scared to approach God. Yes. Yeah. We don't have to be fearful to bring our sins and our shortcomings and our doubts to God. Our misgivings and fears, we can, we can draw near because of the blood of Christ. Not only can we come with boldness because we now have gained access, we now have a high priest. I don't need to confess my sin to some other man All right. in some booth yeah. no. sitting behind a little screen. Yeah. And he could have done something to say to the bottom. Yeah. Or worse. Yeah. But I know somebody yeah. who's seated at the right hand of God with God. Yeah. And that when I sin, not if I sin, but that when I sin, right. I go to my high priest yeah. and he'll make intercession for me. Yeah. We have access 
we have a high priest. Amen. And because of his shed blood, we have clean hearts yes, and a new life. Yes, sir. It has nothing to do with what I did. Because yeah. salvation is not based on what I did. It's based on what's already been done in my behalf. I ain't nothing but an old wretch, but I've got a high priest. I'm not worthy to even come into his presence, but I've got an elder brother. I've got an advocate, a lawyer who goes before me. And when Satan accuses me of what I've done wrong, Jesus, my advocate, with the Father, Jesus, my lawyer, Jesus, my high priest, stands up on the right hand of God the Father and says, oh, yes. He's guilty of that. He did it. But guess what? I paid for it in full at Calvary. His blood washed away my sin and gave me a pure heart and a new life. It reaches the highest mountain, flows to the lowest path. And that blood gives me strength from day to day. And it will never lose this power. Anybody been here? Guilty when you came to church. Yeah. And the Lord just wiped the guilt off your face. Yeah. And off your heart and off your soul. Yeah. And now you're able to worship him with a pure conscience. Yes, Not because you didn't sin, but because Jesus took care of it at the cross. Yes. We're not perfect. No. We're just forgiven. Right. There's none righteous. Right. No, not one. Yeah. Isaiah helps us here. He says, woe is me, mm -hmm. for I'm undone. I'm a man of unclean lips, yeah. and I dwell amongst a people of unclean lips. Uh -huh. Then he said, those seraphims took some live coals from off the altar, touched my lips, and said, your iniquity is purged, and your sin forgiven. Yeah. Then, then after Isaiah said, I saw something, and after I sent something, he said, I heard something. Yeah. I heard the voice of God saying, whom shall I send? Yeah. And who will go for us? Yeah. Then said, I hear am I? Send me. But the only way I, I can go, I've got to be cleaned up. And the only way I can be cleaned up is through the one who does the cleaning, yeah. Jesus Christ. Yeah. What can wash away my sin? Yeah. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Yeah. What can make me whole again? Yeah. Nothing but the blood yes, of Jesus. Yes, fellowship draws us near, but secondly, fellowship helps us hold fast. Yes, Verse 23, hold fast the profession of your faith. Because he who promised is faithful. Mm -hmm. There's always the danger that we might turn back to the world. Yeah. And if you don't watch yourself, you'll exchange one addiction for the other. Yeah. If you stop drinking, you might start gambling. What? You stop gambling, you might start smoking weed. Yeah. You stop smoking weed, you might start shooting up heroin. There's always the danger of what you got away from, you may go back to. Yeah. The Bible says that the dog will return to his own body. Yeah. The very thing that made him sick in the first place, he'll go back and lick it up. Yeah. Question to you today, what sin have you returned to that you find yourself licking up? What, what habit has you harnessed and held down? What, what weakness keeps on whipping and wearing you down because you keep visiting what you used to do? First John chapter 2 said so they went out from us, but they were not of us. For if they were of, of us, they would no doubt have continued with us. But they went out that they might be made manifest that they were not all of us. Brothers and sisters, when you come to church, you can come all you want. But if you're not saved, it's all for naught. Your confession ought to line up with your profession. Your talk ought to line up with how you walk. We fail. We slip, we fall, but that's why we come to church. So we can get up to be energized to go out and do better next time. Somebody said, we fall down, but we get up. A saint is just a sinner who fell down. Let us draw near. Let us hold fast. And there's one more imperative. Let us consider one another. Fellowship helps us to look after one another. Verses 24 and 25 talks about provoking one another and encouraging one another. That's why you ought to come to church, because something happens at the Lord's house. There's something that goes on here that you, you can look on your computer, watch it on your phone or iPad, but it just ain't the same. You need to be around some flesh and blood. You need to be around people to be a part of a live worship experience and praise God and 
it'll provoke you to get into the worship. Yeah. Now the word pro provoke in the text is both negative and positive. Yes. To provoke negatively means to incite. People can use words to incite a riot. Uh, but on the positive side, provoking means to stir up. That's why Paul told Timothy to stir up the gift that's in you. And for those of you who believe, you can hear the name of Jesus and get stirred up, something wrong with you. Because when you hear his name, as a Christian, as a believer, as a disciple, it ought to do something. When you start thinking about where God brought you from, how many doors he's opened, how many prayers he's responded to in your behalf, how many times he forgave you when you messed up, how many times he made a way out of nowhere? There's just something that go on in his life that's just not the same that your life. It's something that happens when we fellowship more so together than when we're alone. Sometimes I can shout for what God is doing in your life. I can rejoice with you. But this lets me know that if God can bless you like that, that same God can bless me the same way. If God can make a way for you, I'm encouraged he can make a way for me. Right. If I open my mouth and tell God thank you, yeah. he'll do the same thing for me. Church is just not about shaking your head only. Well, it, it's not about clapping your hands only. Yeah. It's about opening your mouth and giving God audible praise. Because yeah. he's worthy of you opening your mouth. Yeah. He's worthy of you telling him thank you. Yeah. I'm glad to be here fellowship. I'm glad God let me live to stand up on a Sunday morning. Not just to wave my hand. Not just to shake my head. But to open my mouth to the cook. She used to say, open my mouth unto the door. Uh, and tell him thank you for the many roads he brought me through. Thank you for the storms you calmed in my life. Thank you for being my provider. Thank you for being my door opener. Thank you for being my way maker. Thank you for being my doctor in a sick room. Thank you for being my lawyer when I was in trouble. Thank you for your mercy. Thank you for your grace. Thank you for your long suffering. Thank you for your kindness. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you that one Friday you died on the Calvary Hill. Jesus died in our place. But early Sunday morning, got up with all power in his hand. And since he got up, all to get up on a Sunday morning and come to church and give him praise. All to come to church and wave my hand. All to come to church and open my mouth and greet my brothers and sisters. Say, so how you doing this morning? What's going on in your life today? Has God been good to you? Well, come on, let's praise him together. Come on, let's magnify him together. Let's lift him up because he's worthy. He is worthy to be praised. Somebody said, what a fellowship. What a joy divine. Leaning on the ever lasting heart. What a blessedness. What a peace is mine. Leaning on the everlasting heart. Oh, how sweet to walk in this beautiful way.